Ireland. Um, he's also an adjunct professor of law at Creighton University um, in Nebraska. He's the author of uh, six books uh, and um, among them, I won't list all the books, among them would be um, A World History of War Crimes from Antiquity to the Present and Nazi Crimes and Their Punishment, A Short History and doc with Documents. So um, all his books are very interested, you know, related to this area. Uh, a new book which will be coming out and we, he and I talked about bringing him back uh, for ne next fall or this spring is on Mein Kampf. Uh, you've, you know, you all know Mein Kampf. Uh, Michael tells me, yeah. he maybe mentioned that he read all of it, which is, uh, he deserves a medal for that. But uh, he's uh, become an expert and he is writing this book with, with others. It's a collection of essays and connected with this will be a documentary, which will be coming out um, on Mein Kampf. So I'm very excited about that, and we'll bring him, we'll bring him back. But meanwhile, we have him today. So let me introduce to you, uh, Professor Dr. Michael Bryant. I like that, Professor Doctor part. You sound like a German, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to give that kind of, you know, Care Professor <laughs> Doctor. Right? Just spin um, to that. <laughs> uh, Ron, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me, and I'm so pleased to be able to finally participate. We had we had lined this up for last spring, and of course, like everything, it went sideways. And I'm really pleased that we have a chance to come back at it again. Uh, now, I, I would have preferred to have done it in person, of course, but uh, this is the next best thing. I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation that will accompany my, my talk, and I'm going to try to share my screen, and hopefully all of this will go according to plan. So let me share screen. Can everybody see that? Not yet, not yet. Let me know if it comes up. Okay. <coughs> Can everybody see the, uh, the slide that says the legacy of the Nuremberg trials? We just, we just saw a picture of a man. It was on the screen very briefly and then it disappeared. Okay, let, let me... Uh, I don't see it. Let me try this again. Maybe it didn't share. Let me try sharing. Okay, okay now let's uh, go this and share. There we go. Okay. I think that's it. That's it, good, great. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Get rid of the pictures. Okay, how does that look? Are we are we in business? Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. All set. All, all set. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to begin my talk today by pointing out I think one of the more unfortunate facts that uh, that confronts us as um, as defenders of human rights and people interested in the lessons of the Holocaust, which is that from the standpoint of international law, warfare is humankind's greatest teacher. It's unfortunate that wars uh, seem to be the best way in which to teach people the, the importance of international, uh, international criminal law and hu uh, human rights, but this does in fact seem to be the case. The Crimean War, for example, in the 1850s gave us the first Geneva Convention and the International Committee for the Red Cross. World War I, of course, uh, gave us the League of Nations, the, uh, the Pact of Paris, also called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, and the Geneva Convention of 1929. And yet, there is no military conflict in history that is more impactful, more influential in international law than World War II. Nearly every feature of the international legal order is influenced by the events of World War II. So I think when, when you talk about the history of humanitarian law, human rights, international criminal law, there really are two major phases. It's pre-World War II and post-World War II. So to give you some idea of how immense and far-reaching the impact of World War II was on international law, I'd like to do a thought experiment with you. 
Imagine that you were a lawyer representing a German Jewish merchant in November of 1938. This German Jewish, Jewish merchant has come to you and told you that uh, on November 9th of 1938, he was attacked by stormtroopers. His business was burned to the ground. Uh, he himself was assaulted. Uh, some teeth were broken out. His jaw was broken. And he's coming to you for help. He wants to know whether you can provide him with some kind of remedy or help represent him in a case against his attackers. What in 1938 uh, could you have done for him? Could you, for example, have tried to sue his attackers in a German domestic court? Would that have been a well-advised course of action? And the answer is that it would not have been, not, not in 1938, that would have exposed you and your client to retaliation that might have led to uh, ruinous consequences for both of you. So if you don't have or did not have in 1938 recourse under domestic law in German courts, could you have sought relief through some other, um, some other court system, some other level of authority beyond the nation state of Germany? Could you, for example, have um, gone to uh, the European Union as you could today and pled your case there? And the answer, unfortunately, is that you could not have because the European Union, as we know, did not exist in 1938, nor was there any regional body at that time that would have been capable of providing uh, some kind of legal remedy to your client. So the regional solution is out, the domestic solution is out. What about international law? Could you have sought an international solution or remedy for your client? Um, the answer here too is that you could not have. Why is this the case? Before World War II, individuals did not have rights as subjects under international law. The only protection that individuals had was based upon their nationality. And so it was the government of the country to which a person uh, or of which a person was a citizen that had the right to protect its nationals on the theory that an injury done to a citizen of a state was vicariously an injury done to that country as well. So it was the state of the country to which a person belonged that could demand redress for a wrong that their citizen had experienced abroad. And the international community had no responsibility nor even authority really to intervene. This was the situation as the world teetered on the brink of war in the late 1930s. One of the great jurists uh, in the first half of the 20th century was a man named Lasse Oppenheim. The, first, the fifth edition of his celebrated treatise on international law, um, his editor was this man, and you see the photograph there in the, on the slide, that's Hirsch Lauterpacht, who is also a renowned international uh, jurist, international law expert of the first half of the 20th century. In a footnote to Oppenheim's great treatise, Lauterpacht uh, wrote that persons harmed by their own country, like our hypothetical Jewish client, enjoyed no protection whatsoever under international law at that time. So the book was published in 1937, just a year before the Reich Night of Broken Glass. Um, and so at this time, there was no remedy for a person situated like our hypothetical Jewish client. How a state treated its own nationals within its own territory was entirely within the domestic jurisdiction of that state. This principle of sovereign inviolability was not just a theoretical, theoretical matter. It had very uh, concrete real world consequences. And the case in point involves the United States in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. I'm sure many of you know uh, of the pogroms that were launched against Jews living in Romania and in Russia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which drove um, legions of Jews out of these areas and, uh, and overseas in search of, uh, of host countries, including here in the United States. 
So in protesting the policies targeting Jews in Romania and in Russia, the United States had to tread very carefully. It had to avoid the accusation that it was interfering in the domestic jurisdiction of Russia and Romania. So how did American diplomats finesse this issue? They argued that the persecution of the Jews in Romania and Russia at this time was forcing these people to flee to the United States where the fugitives were becoming burdens on the United States and on its infrastructure. In other words, the United States could not make a humanitarian argument in the late 19th and early 20th century. It could only argue that you know, the killing and persecution of Jews in these, in, these, uh, in these countries were having ill effects on the United States in the form of immigration. So if you're ever wondering why it was that the international community did not intervene sooner in Hitler's mistreatment of German Jews in the 1930s, this is the answer. Hitler was entitled to do with his own population, his own minorities, in this case, the German Jews, whatever he wanted to do with them. It was entirely a matter of domestic jurisdiction. Now, this may uh, be offensive to us today. It may grate on our, our ethical, our moral sensibilities, but this was the state of affairs heading into World War II. And so for this reason, there really was nothing that could have been, been done for our hypothetical German Jewish merchant client in 1938. And in fact, if Hitler had decided to launch the final solution in 1938 rather than in 1941, there is very little that the world community could have done, at least at a legal level, in terms of international law, to prevent the genocide. Well, then we have the war between 1939 and 1945. Um, and by 1945, policymakers and political leaders um, across the world were increasingly of the conviction that international law had problems, right? It had, had major deficiencies that manifested themselves in, in the form of these horrible atrocities that took place during the war, both in Europe and of course also in the Pacific theater. And a conviction grew among uh, the world's leaders and their populations that protection for human rights should not be lodged entirely at the level of a person's nationality. And not only should human rights be more vigilantly protected, but the conviction grew that international law had to find ways or should find ways to punish perpetrators, to hold people who committed these atrocities accountable criminally for what they were doing. Bear in mind that neither of these concepts, neither of these concepts was accepted in the world before World War II, world war, war II beyond maybe a collection, a very small collection of utopian thinkers. But in terms of policymakers and political leaders, nobody adhered to this view until really 1945 and thereafter. Arguably, the modern human rights era begins with the UN Charter, which was signed in June of 1945, becoming effective in October of 1945. There was hope at this time that the drafting of the Charter would also proclaim an enforceable human, uh, Bill of Human Rights. Despite uh, the support of smaller countries at the UN's meeting in San Francisco to found uh, the United Nations in the spring of 1945, as well as lobbying by Jewish organizations and Jewish leaders, an enforceable human rights provision never emerged in the UN Charter. And this is really because powerful countries aligned themselves against an enforceable human rights provision. Now, some of these countries probably are not surprising for anybody listening to my words today. Uh, Stalin's uh, Russia, his USSR, uh, opposed an enforceable human rights provision, but so did uh, Western countries with uh, long histories of defending civil rights and liberties and being committed to, um, to international human rights, like Great Britain, 
and France, and also our own United States of America. Now, why did the USA oppose an enforceable Bill of Rights? Well, bear in mind who uh, was controlling the Senate at the time. The Senate was uh, in the control of a coalition of Southern segregationist Democrats and conservative Midwestern Republicans. Neither one of these two groups supported the idea of treaties that would allow federal courts, or for that matter, international courts, to overrule the numerous discriminatory laws and practices that existed throughout the country, particularly in the Jim Crow South. This coalition would have refused to ratify the UN Charter if it contained an enforceable human rights protection. And I hope that you understand why. Under Article 6 of our Constitution, the Charter, if it were ratified, would have superseded any state or federal laws that conflicted with it. Now, the Truman administration was uh, deeply involved, of course, in negotiations over uh, the United Nations and over the Charter for the United Nations. And the Truman administration remembered the fate of Woodrow Wilson's efforts to obtain Senate ratification of the League of Nations after World War I. And of course, you all know this story. The United States agreed to, uh, to the League of Nations, but the treaty was never ratified, which meant the United States never joined the League of Nations. The prospect of the United States again in 1945 failing to ratify a treaty that would have brought the United States into the United Nations was simply uh, unthinkable and inadmissible for the Truman administration. And so for this reason, the Truman administration similarly did not want to see an enforceable human rights provision inserted into the charter. They were afraid that the Senate would not ratify it. And so what we get instead of enforceable language, concerning human rights in the UN Charter is this, and I've reproduced the language on your, your overhead, on your PowerPoint slide. This is the language about human rights in the UN Charter. Uh, the United Nations shall promote universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedom for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion, which sounds fine, except that it doesn't really amount to a hill of beans, right? It it's, it's, doesn't really have an enforcement mechanism. All it is is a lofty sentiment without any accompanying way to enforce that sentiment. The human rights chart, I'm sorry, the UN Charter was followed three years later by arguably the most important human rights document in the history of human rights, the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. This is a, uh, uh, a convention proclaimed by the UN General Assembly, which was adopted as a non-binding UN resolution. Um, what did it do? I, I'm not going to recite all of the various uh, rights that uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights sought to protect. You probably know many of these already, but some, some very, very basic rights uh, concerning freedom from discrimination based on race, gender, class, politics or religion, or for that matter, colonial status, guarantees of life, liberty, and security, the right to be free of slavery and torture, and so forth and so on. But this is a milestone in the history of human rights. Um, and it was followed by the UN Genocide Convention in 1948, which became effective in 1951, and a spate of other treaties and conventions for the next several decades. And I've mentioned a few of them on the, on the outline the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and much later in the 1980s, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Human rights today are enforceable um, within the UN by means of committees that are entrusted to supervise implementation of the rights that they guarantee. But it's important to bear in mind at the same time 
that human rights are enforceable not only within the United Nations, but also at regional and intergovernmental levels as well, like the Council of Europe, like the Organization of American States, and the Organization of African Unity. I want to talk for a moment about the Council of Europe. In the early 1950s, the Council of Europe comprised only Western European democratic states. They adopted a European Convention of Human Rights, which uh, was directly based upon the UN Declaration of Rights of 1948. Its purpose, according to its preamble, was precisely this, to guarantee the rights specified in the Universal Declaration. The Holocaust was the most direct catalyst to the European Convention on Human Rights. Consider, for example, the words of a French foreign minister who was a leading proponent of the convention. And I'll just uh, summarize several of his, uh, his words in a statement he gave about the rationale behind the convention. This is what he said. Democracies do not become Nazi countries in one day. Evil progresses cunningly with a minority operating to remove the levers of power. One by one, freedoms are suppressed, and then the Fuhrer is installed, and the evolution continues even to the oven of the crematorium, and so forth. Very clearly, this French minister was indicating the influence of the Holocaust on the European Convention as a major catalyst of it. Perhaps most uniquely, the European Convention established a regional human rights court, the European Court of Human Rights, which enforces the protections afforded under the convention. The European court since its creation has become the constitutional court of Europe for questions of human rights. And for those of us uh, from an American background, it, it seems utterly remarkable. But in Europe, state courts, state parties have recognized the superior authority of the European court of human rights and they try to align their own verdicts with its rulings. Uh, it's not unusual for a person to file an, a, uh, uh, an appeal to the Supreme Court of whatever European country they are citizens of, and if they lose at that level, if they feel that they have a basic right that has not been adequately protected, they will launch a complaint with the European Court of Human Rights, and from time to time, the court finds in favor of the plaintiff. It is, it is then returned to the Supreme Court of the country that is to, to which the, the person belongs as a national, and invariably that Supreme Court will then re reverse its earlier verdict and adopt the verdict of the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, this is simply unthinkable in the United States today, but this is the situation in Europe. The Organization of American States is another regional body that has adopted a Convention on Human Rights, uh, the American Convention on Human Rights. This is a document that is modeled on the European Convention. In 1978, an Inter-American Commission and Court of Human Rights came into being to enforce the terms of the American Convention. U.S. President Jimmy Carter at that time signed the convention, but the U.S. Senate blocked ratification, and for this reason, the United States never became a signatory to the European Court of Human Rights. Today, all Western Hemispheric nations other than the United States, Canada, and several Caribbean Commonwealth countries are parties to this document and to this court. A similar human rights treaty, the African Charter of Human and People's Rights, exists on the continent of Africa and has been in effect since 1986. Now, if we are to, to assess then human rights and their progress in the modern era, I think it's important uh, to note that states do not always comply with human rights standards. It would be naive to think that they do. Right? Many states, of course, just pay lip service to human rights without necessarily respecting them. This much is clear. However, it is important to take the full measure of the human rights revolution since 1945. The human rights structure as set forth in the United Nations and in these regional bodies, like the Organization of American States and the European Council, has produced notable achievements. Some of these achievements 
uh, have been quite visible. It's not unusual for countries to, um, to premise the extension of military aid or even trade deals with other countries upon their compliance with human rights standards. Um, oftentimes developmental aid ex extended from European countries to other maybe lesser developed countries or by the United States to lesser developed countries will be specifically premised upon the receiving country's compliance with, uh, with human rights standards. Governments today find it almost impossible to divorce human rights from considerations of political, from their uh, consideration of their political and economic decisions. This is a major breakthrough uh, since 1945 and is uh, an integral part of the human rights regime that we live in today. So far, we have talked uh, about the impact of the Holocaust on, uh, in World War II on, on human rights. I would like to shift the focus a bit for the remainder of my talk about the second major area of the Holocaust's legal impact, that is international criminal law. And my hunch is that uh, those of you attending my talk today probably know more about this area of the impact of the Holocaust on law than you do about human rights, because almost everyone has heard of the Nuremberg war crimes trials. I think you could probably run, uh, run out into the street and ask somebody if they, they were aware that trials took place in the city of Nuremberg after the war. I think most adults would at least say that they have heard of these trials before. Um, so there was a degree of familiarity with what happened in Nuremberg, maybe not with the precise details of the trials that took place. But certainly people are aware of the fact that Nazi war criminals were hauled in front of an international court after World War II. The International Military Tribunal, as it was called at Nuremberg, along with its counterpart in Tokyo, a much less known counterpart, by the way, the Tokyo International Military Tribunal, these were the first international courts, criminal courts in world history to preside over uh, international crimes. After the two international military courts in Nuremberg and Tokyo adjourned, they were dissolved, and no comparable international court would come into existence until 1993. So from the late 1940s until 1993, there was no comparable international court that was held to preside over uh, international crimes of this nature. In 1993, the UN Security Council formed an ad hoc court, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. which just recently wound down its, uh, its work. Uh, I think the mechanism is still involved in, uh, in wrapping up the final details, but uh, the cases have more or less come to, a, come to an end in The Hague. One year after the formation of the ICTY, a sister court was formed in Rwanda, the ICTR, which uh, is still prosecuting cases in Arusha, Tanzania, related to the Rwandan genocide. Arguably the most important court was the International Criminal Court established by the Rome Treaty in 2003. International legal scholars had urged the creation of an International Criminal Court to prosecute humanitarian offenses for many, many decades. In fact, if you look at the, um, you look at the Genocide Convention of 1948, you will find in Article 6, an explicit reference to an international penal court. And the idea uh, that the UN had in mind was to try to, to create some way to enforce the provisions of, uh, of the Genocide Convention. Now, of course, this, this body never came into being until much, much later, not until 2003 with the formation of the ICC was this international court uh, called into existence. So it took a while to work itself out. And it's ironic because although no international court existed before World War II to prosecute international crimes, there was a generally accepted recognition that individuals were criminally liable for violations of international law. And this actually went back a long way into the past, actually all the way back to the Greeks and the Romans in antiquity. Even they recognized that there was an international crime that any 
uh, any kingdom, any nation state at that time couldn't, could punish uh, based on international premises. And that was the international crime of piracy. Piracy was the first international crime in world history for which persons were considered responsible and punishable. Until Nuremberg, however, and in the 40-odd year gap between Nuremberg and the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, such offenses were invariably tried and punished when they were prosecuted at all, only in national courts. No international courts existed for that purpose. Now, let me ask you this question, um, which you don't necessarily have to answer, uh, at least verbally at this point. Maybe we could talk about this during the question and answer session. But what is the problem, if any, with looking towards national courts to try international offenses? What is the fly in the ointment when it comes to national courts? The problem that has presented itself over and over again in national efforts to hold perpetrators accountable is that national courts are really reluctant to go after, after the big fish. They would much prefer going after the minnows and the, uh, the plankton. Uh, the big fish are not typically uh, a topic of interest for national courts. And this is why the International Tribunal, I'm sorry, the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg is so important. It's the first time in world history that top government leaders like Hermann Goering, portrayed on your, your slide here, uh, were prosecuted for international crimes when, when some of the leading officials of the Nazi government were put on trial. And these were leading figures of industry, uh, the, the major corporations in Germany at the time, like, like Krupp and the Flick Industries. Um, had, had Hitler survived the war, he too would have been put on trial along with Goering and the rest of them. So this is a very consequential moment in the history of, uh, of prosecuting international offenses. So what did the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg prosecute? What were the, uh, the offenses listed against the defendants there? Well, there wasn't just one offense, right? They didn't just charge them with, uh, with war crimes or, or only with crimes against humanity. They were charged with really with five different offenses. War crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, conspiracy, and membership in a criminal organization. So let me, let me talk for a minute or two about each one of these. War crimes, what were war crimes? They were considered violations of the law of war. That is, the law of war as set forth in two documents, the Hague Convention of 1907 and the Geneva Conventions, which go back to the 1860s, but there were various iterations of them. Uh, the most recent before Nuremberg was the 1929 Geneva Conventions. And that was really the primary war crimes foundation along with the Hague Convention at Nuremberg. So violations of the law of war as uh, contained in the Hague and Geneva Conventions. Crimes against humanity. These had never been prosecuted in international uh, law up until this time. What were these? They were largely focused on crimes committed on civilians. Now, there is overlap between war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, but as a general rule, kind of a, a heuristic you can use to, to sort the two out in your own mind, it helps just to think of war crimes as primarily applying to combatants and crimes against humanity as applying primarily to civilians. So these were crimes involving uh, you know, homicides and murder, uh, extermination, kidnapping, uh, rape, and, and other you know, personal bodily offenses were described as being crimes against humanity, especially when they were committed against civilian populations. Now, it's important to observe that at the IMT, the International Military Tribunal, according to the court, to be prosecutable as a crime against humanity, there had to be some connection between uh, the criminal act and the conduct of the war. This is sometimes called the war nexus. And nexus means a connection. So there had to be a connection between what the defendant was accused of doing and the events of the war. 
And again, this, this had very real world impacts, this definition of crimes against humanity. Let's go back to our hypothetical German Jewish merchant who was roughed up during Reichskristallnacht and his business burned to the ground. Could we have sought some kind of relief for our client at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg? Could, could we prosecute his attackers at the IMT? And the answer is that you could not have. Right? Why? Because there was no war nexus. Keep in mind the circumstances of, of Kristallnacht. It took place in November of 1938. This is well before the outbreak of the war. And in fact, the attack on the Jewish community in Germany had, had nothing to do with, uh, with warfare. It was, uh, it was an attack launched by the government and its auxiliaries against a minority population. And for this reason, then, that war nexus would not have been satisfied and in, in, in what was done to our, our German Jewish client could not have been redressed in uh, a court such as the, the IMT at Nuremberg. Well, in addition to crimes against humanity and uh, war crimes, crimes against peace were uh, charged against the defendants at Nuremberg. This is an, another, another term for this is aggressive war. It's really a synonym for crimes against peace. These were considered violations of uh, the Pact of Paris, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, as it's also called, which was signed in the mid-1920s. Conspiracy is another offense that was, uh, was charged against the Nuremberg defendants. So in addition to the substantive offenses, like war crimes, crimes against peace, crimes against uh, humanity, the defendants were also charged with uh, with conspiring to commit war crimes, conspiring to commit crimes against humanity, and conspiring to commit crimes against peace. And then finally, there were efforts by the prosecutors at Nuremberg um, to get the court to recognize certain organizations within the Nazi state as being criminal organizations. And there were, was an effort to get seven separate Nazi organizations designated as criminal organizations. The, the court ultimately recognized only four as being criminal. And they were the leadership core of the Nazi party, the Gestapo, the, uh, the SS, and the security service. Now, could you, let's go back to our German Jewish client, hypothetical German Jewish client. Could you have prosecuted the attackers of our client um, for, at the IMT for being members of the SA? That is for being stormtroopers because the stormtroopers were the primary uh, you know, thugs who carried out these attacks on Jews during the November pogrom. And the answer yet again is that you could not have. Um, why? Because the SA was not deemed to be a criminal organization. So merely belonging to the SA or even carrying out uh, dubious acts on behalf of the SA um, was not considered to be criminal by, by the court because the SA was not deemed to be a criminal organization. Now, it's important to recognize that today, crimes against humanity are no longer tied exclusively to warfare they can actually be prosecuted even if they occur during peacetime. That's a major change since the end of World War II. So what about genocide? Was genocide charged at Nuremberg? Um, I, I run into quite a bit of confusion about this, even among you know, students of mine who take my Holocaust course. A lot of students think that, that the Nazis were charged with genocide at Nuremberg and convicted of genocide. And what makes this especially confusing is that you will find references in the indictment against the major war criminals. You'll, see, you'll find references to genocide. But as it turns out, genocide was not charged at Nuremberg. It was not charged at Nuremberg. Why? The reason is that the Allies were afraid that there was not enough of a basis in international law 
to justify charging the defendants with genocide. It just was not considered established enough. Don't forget, the word only came into, into existence in 1944, coined by the Polish jurist Raphael Lemkin in his book, Axis Rule in Europe. So at the time of, of the Nuremberg trials, the word had only been in coinage, had been in circulation for maybe a year, a year and a half. And it was just considered too novel and too new. And yet you will find references to genocide in, in the text of the indictment. Interestingly enough, there was one court system that did in the 1940s charge their Nazi defendants with genocide. And if I were doing this, uh, this live, I would try to prompt the audience at this point to try to see if anybody knows what court system did charge their, uh, their Nazi defendants with genocide. And I'll just provide you with the answer. Um, it was the Poles, the Polish Supreme National Tribunal, which began to ho hold trials in 1946 and 1947, actually charged in addition to several other offenses, including murder, they charged their Nazi defendants, not all of them, but some of them like Rudolf Hirst, the former commandant of Auschwitz, and a handful of others, charged them with the crime of genocide, convicted them of it, and, um, and people were hanged because they were found guilty of, of genocide. Not until the promulgation of the UN Genocide Convention in 1948 did the international community recognize genocide as a crime under international law. But of course, the Poles beat them by several months. This being said, no international court prosecuted and convicted a defendant for genocide until the 1990s, not until the ICTY uh, in the, its uh, uh, prosecution of crimes from the Balkan Wars in the 1990s was there a, uh, a prosecution for genocide and of course the Rwandan tribunal also um, prosecuted the former prime minister of Rwanda of, of genocide in the mid-1990s. But until that time all prosecutions for genocide were done and the rare occasion in which they were charged at all were done by national courts. National courts like the one held in Jerusalem in 1960, in 1961, trying Adolf Eichmann. I'd like to, to sum up uh, what I've been talking about for the past 40 minutes or so, and then perhaps go to, uh, to question and answer with uh, folks who are, who are attending our, uh, uh, my lecture today. It's very clear that there is a new paradigm of state account accountability, which comes into being for international crimes after 1945. And this is very much conditioned by the experience of the Holocaust and of World War II. The UN explicitly linked the defense of human rights with the preservation of world peace. There was a very conscious equation of the defense of human rights as a way to prevent the outbreak of World War III. And that remains an equation in effect until the present day. Uh, so the international community seeks to protect human rights not only because it is the right thing to do, but because violators of human rights uh, oftentimes become involved also in wars of aggression that can upset the international legal order. And the kinds of changes that I've talked about whether at the level of human rights enforcement or at the level of international criminal law, were simply inconceivable prior to 1945. This is a dramatic and sweeping change in both the theory and the practice of international law that was unthinkable before 1945. Thank you for your attendance today, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you all might have. People can um, either put things in the chat or just, you know, speak up <laughs> if you don't mind. I, I was wondering how, how does this um, international law impact what's going on in Syria today? Where the, the government is killing their own people. Well, there, there of course is discussion of um, creating a tribunal for, for crimes committed in Syria. And uh, the situation, of course, is very volatile. The Russians backed the Syrians, and as members of the Security Council, they had an absolute veto 
uh, so the Russians would, would present an obstacle to that. Um, but arguably, uh, if there was a will at the level of the great powers, then they would be able at some point to, uh, to call into being a, a tribunal, not unlike that which prosecuted crimes related to the Balkan Wars or to the Rwandan genocide. Thank you. See the chat, um, Dr. Bryant. NGOs accountable for atrocities. Yes, of course. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to be a, uh, a classical state in order to violate international law. But yes, the answer is yes. I yeah, there's have a, a question. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Um, yes, ma'am. Do you think do you think much is done today in the world um, in uh, a country, any country, trying to help uh, victims of severe crimes in other countries? I mean, does it work? I read recently. I I believe it was in Iran that a young a young man. He may have been a boxer or something. Anyway, he was accused, I believe, of a, a trumped up charge from whatever I've read. And um, he was due to be hanged mm -hmm. in Iran. And uh, President Trump um, argued in his behalf for one thing. Uh, but he was hanged. In other words, does it help? Uh, it, does it have any teeth in it now, the international law theory? Well, you're, you're about, you're, you know, yeah. helping people that are you're, you're, you're placing your finger on, on a, okay. a, a continuing continuing problem with international law which is enforceability and um, I mean there have been some spectacular yeah. failure, failures of the international community to enforce international law and I mean I ma made reference to Rwanda didn't really get into a discussion of Rwanda but um, that was a yeah a, a failure of epic proportion um, and again, it was because of a failure of will yeah. on the part of the inter okay. international community, and in particular the United States, to intervene in the conflict in order to prevent uh, uh, genocide on, on the on the Tutsis by the by the ethnic Hutus. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, we we have an international framework. Yeah. We have an international framework. The problem is frequently there is a, a there is a the lack of a will to make it happen. On, on the other hand, there have been spectacular successes too. I mean, the dismantlement of apartheid in South Africa was arguably conditioned by the human rights revolution. But for that, I think apartheid would probably still exist today. Um, the, the Arab Spring was largely brought into being by awareness of human rights uh, issues. And, um, and of course, the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 was in, in no small yeah. part abetted by um, the perception that the Soviet government was a perpetrator of uh, human rights violations. So there have been some, some significant breakthroughs. Yeah. The, the, the bombing of, um, of, uh, of, uh, in Albania of the, of the Serbs in the late 1990s was a humanitarian mission to try yeah. to prevent genocide against uh, ethnic Albani Albanian Kosovars. Yeah. So there have been, I mean, there have been successful <laughs> moments in that history. Yeah, there have been, I guess. But too dispiriting many of the other failures though. too, dispiriting failures too. And maybe the yeah. one that you're referring to, the, the boxer. Yeah, I remember, remember reading this about this in the papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Thank you. There's no international police, right? Um, and uh, countries are still very, uh, very vigilant about protecting their, uh, their rights of sovereignty. So this is a lingering problem with international law. Uh, the the UN does sure. send in does send in troops, don't they? Uh, they can. Yeah, they did that in Rwanda, but unfortunately, it was as you know they were withdrawn, and um, and then there was opposition to any further intervention until nine hundred thousand people had been murdered. So, yes, there uh, there, are, there are UN troops, but um, their ability to enforce again is is subject to the uh, the vagaries of great power uh, politics. I heard a voice, but uh, I'm not sure who it was. Somebody. There's a question in the chat from Howard. 
I think Mike has already answered that question. Um, hi, hi, Howard. How are you? <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Mike. Good, good to see you again. Yeah. Good to see you. I had a question about, you mentioned that the Nerva trial kind of went after the big, big actors as opposed to going after the minnows. But yeah. what was the legal reasoning for uh, how far down the chain of command one should go in order to try people for crimes? Yeah. Yeah, really, the, the IMT was devoted to, to the to the major figures. And they, they really would consider primarily the leaders of, the, of some of the leading organizations involved in war crimes, crimes against peace and crimes against humanity. That was the first cut. And then there was another cut made after the IMT adjourned, which tried the next level down, the next echelon. So uh, there were a series of trials. I didn't really talk about them in my presentation, but a series of trials, 12 altogether that the United States, the United States held at, uh, at Nuremberg. And they started off with doctors, uh, Nazi doctors who were involved in um, concentration camp experiments. And so these were the, the, the heads of, uh, of the SS doctor corps, for example. Um, Karl Brandt, in fact, it was called US versus Brandt. Uh, Karl Brandt was Hitler's personal physician and was involved in, um, as a supervisor, as a, an administrative figure in, um, in the concentration camp uh, experiment program. Um, there was a, a trial involving um, Nazi judges, you know, the, the, the heads of, some of the people's courts and some of the special courts like Oswald Rothaug. Uh, so the, these were, they were powerful figures, uh, but they weren't quite at the level of, of Goering and uh, Ribbentrop and you know, as the foreign minister Ribbentrop. Uh, had, had Himmler not committed suicide, he would have been tried at, at Nuremberg as the head of the SS. So the idea was to put the, the really top people on trial at the IMT, and then the next level down would be tried in these successive successor trials. And you know, the, the heads of the Einsatzgruppen, uh, who were involved in shooting Jews in Eastern Europe, were also tried at Nuremberg in these successor trials. And then the belief was that you could leave the ground level people, so this would have been concentration camp um, guards, um, kind of, kind of the, lo the lowest level, the direct hands-on perpetrators who were receiving the orders from the top people, and even from the mid-level people, they would be tried by, um, by army courts. So there are a series of hundreds and hundreds of trials conducted by, um, by the British, the British military courts, and also by the US Army um, that some of you may be familiar with. You know, some very, very interesting cases um, involving um, uh, the commandants of some of the some of the concentration camps in Germany, as well as the the rank and file, who are members of the guard staff. So yeah, there was a commitment to the more the more elite figures at the international court, and then at the su the successor trials that the Americans did, and then the the small fish that you referred to and that I referred to, were really tried by the uh, the U.S. Army and by the British Army and the, the French military as well. Yeah. Um, could I ask you something? Uh, how do you how do you figure that so many of the um, uh, you know the concentration camp commandos, so to speak, got out of the country? You know, went to Argentina easily, yeah. uh, and you attribute the Catholic Church as having a role in that? Yeah, this this is a uh, obviously a topic that is. Uh, uh, incendiary right and it has been a yeah I, I mean people have talked about this and focused on this for years including probably some of the people listening to my talk today and you probably know more about the details of it than I do um, I mean I, I'm familiar with the basic facts uh, that there, there were members of the church who did effect the, uh, the the flight of Nazi war criminals from Europe after the war uh, there were also uh, net networks of, of, of persons uh, both with both in Latin America and within Germany, who were able to get them out and uh, give them pseudonyms. Uh, Eichmann, of course, was one of these figures who was able to escape to Argentina. Yeah. But yes, there's pl plenty of blame to go around, and there is a cottage industry of books and of scholars who have uh, who focused on this. It's yeah. uh, uh, kind of remote from my own uh, research and my own writing, but to, which focuses more upon legal doctrines and crimes, the actual crimes of the Nazis. But yeah, there's plen plenty of blame to go around. And uh, um, many, many people, uh, Klaus Barbie being another, of course, who were able to escape. Some of them were caught yeah. and, brought, and brought back to justice. Um, 
former Treblinka, uh, Treblinka commandant, um, I'm blanking on his name right now, um, is the topic of Gita Sereni's book, Into, the, Into That Darkness, Stangl, Franz, Franz Stangl, was oh, yeah. able, to, able to escape, mm -hmm. of course. And, and then was eventually brought back and put on trial in Germany, of all places, and uh, wound up yeah. dying, in, dying in, in prison. But similarly, he, yeah. was, he was abetted by, by people who, uh, in posi power, positions of power, whether in the church or in the government, the German government, or in Latin yeah. American governments, given a pseudonym. And um, some of these people were put on trial later on, Eichmann being the most infamous of those figures. But others uh, yeah. never, never were. Uh, um, Mengele, Josef Mengele, uh, was, was never put on trial. Eventually, they think that he probably wound up uh, dying in a, in a, I think he was drowned in some sort of a swimming accident, but that was in 1972. Yeah. But he was able to elude capture, you know, and eventually died yeah. at that time. So, and there are others too who have managed to escape retribution. Oh yeah, many, many. I have to go now, it was a, it was a very, very, um, so informative, so oh. well done. Thank, Thank you, you for so attending. Much. My pleasure. Thank you. It, it, my pleasure. Come again. Come again. We'll do. Well, well with this mind well, comp event's a possibility everybody. next year. Yeah, okay? we'll, do, we'll do that. Um, I hope. I hope. Yeah. My, Michael, I mentioned that um, Christopher Browning, who wrote Ordinary Men, uh, we, there was a seminar yesterday, and he people uh, discussed the fact that those men who were in the order police, these were, as you say, low-level people, but they were the ones who were committing you know, yep. doing the shooting and those who gave the, and they had the opportunity not to do it. And they, they did, you know, they, chose. they, they followed suit. So, but mm -hmm. they were, they were not, uh, you know, they were given, um, from, you know, they were allowed to testify and given, I can't remember, I can't think of the term of them. You know, they, in other words, they never, they were never tried or um, in order for them to kind of give their own testimony. Uh, they, they, they were tried in, in, in Browning's uh, yeah, study. He, th these these individuals were tried. They were tried much later, though, in the 1960s. Oh. Yeah, they oh, were okay. tried. They were tried in the 1960s. They weren't tried in the 1940s. You were correct. Most of the, most of them escaped um, a judicial confrontation until much later. Um, and then I think it was in Hamburg. I think there was a court in Hamburg that put them on trial. In fact, a lot of the, the evidence that Browning used was from that court case. Right. Yeah. He talks about that. You know, that they were, but that's what he, one of the things he said was that they were uh, free, they freely testified because they thought they weren't going to be charged. Right. Uh, right. I don't know how, what, how many of those there were, but anyway. Uh, oh, well, what he said was that they were testifying against their commanders. They didn't like their commanders, so they were happy to testify against their commanders. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's what you do in the criminal law though, right? You take the lower people to dime out the higher if you can. Right. But the problem, of course, in their case is that they, they themselves were involved in, in shooting Jews. So Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Brian, I think we have a question from Reed uh, McKinney in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Has, there been, has there been any uh, successful movement in the U.S. to hold our government officials accountable to international law, especially <laughs> concerning the wars with yeah. Russia. Yeah, forgive, forgive me for snickering a little bit. Um, um, there are times when you think that international criminal law is for export only in the United States, right? Um, and I'm, I th I'm thinking in particular of the, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, which I've written a little bit about in the past. And um, yeah, if you, if you look at the aftermath of, of the Abu Ghraib scandal or some of the crimes that, that were committed uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq and other, other parts of the Middle East during the uh, global war on terror, as they called it, the only people who were prosecuted were the lowest levels, the absolute lowest levels. Uh, members of the government were, were not put on trial. Um, individuals who crafted you know, the torture memo, for example, coming out of the Office of Legal Counsel and and the White House were never ever held accountable for what they did, um, proving yet again that it's uh, it's typically the lowest level people who are who are blamed. You know, they they say that that blame is always pushed down in an organization to the lowest levels, and credit always moves up to the top. And that's that's been my experience, not only in working in the military for a period of time, but also in my studies of Nazi criminality and then the post-war 
you know, reckoning with that criminality. What's remarkable about Nuremberg, of course, is that you have the top people who are on. Yeah, on that's, that's what I thought. But, but they lost the war. Right? <laughs> Had they won the war, uh, you wouldn't have seen uh, Hermann Goering in the dock, I can guarantee you that. Um, you might have seen Churchill in the dock. But because uh, they were planning, if they had won the war, the Germans were planning on putting Churchill on trial. So, um, so the answer to your question, I think, uh, was Reed McKinney who, who asked the question, uh, not much success in holding our government officials accountable. Of course, you, many of you know what Trump's policies are on the um, United States applying international law to its own, own crimes. I mean, the, Trump has, has pardoned uh, hardened war criminals responsible for murdering men, women, and children in, in Iraq. He just most recently pardoned somebody just a, just a few months ago, um, this Gallagher. Uh, yeah, that's right. Who uh, was a, a, real, a really real bad actor. I mean, this is a guy who murdered a, a, um, a person who had been arrested, murdered him with his, his hunting knife, you know, um, murdered suspects, uh, sniped uh, young girls from, from a tree, apparently, and Trump pardoned him. He would have assuredly, he was being court-martialed, right? He would have assuredly have been um, convicted and probably put away for a long time. But, but part, and then he, now he's campaigning for Trump. You have a notorious war criminal who shot men, women, and children in cold blood who is campaigning for Trump with Trump's uh, awareness and, and with his endorsement. So... The answer to your question, um, Reed, is uh, we could do better, I think. Uh, Vince, uh, Michael, Vince. have a question. Uh, did I hear you correctly that both England and France, or great, or the UK and France, ha are uh, have voted to subject themselves to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? Is that correct, or? It's, it's hard to answer that question because often, oftentimes countries will file reservations. They, they, might, they might subscribe to a convention, right? It looks good on paper, but then if you, you have to look at the reservations. And I don't know what, what the reservations are with, with France and, and Great Britain. Forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm not a jurist, you know, so I don't follow the, the, you know, the, the most recent uh, endorsements of, or, or um, uh, ratifications of the, uh, of the Rome Statute. Um, so I don't know exactly what the status of, of France and Britain are in terms of reservations that they would have made to the exercise of that jurisdiction. Most, m most superpowers will opt out, right? Or, or if they do sign on, they'll carve out their assent with these reservations. That's why you have to look very closely at them. And we do the same thing, right? If we, if we approve a convention, the government will say, yes, you know, we're, we're trying to advance the cause of human rights and, uh, and um, injustice in the world. But then if you look at the reservations, you'll see that, in fact, the country hasn't really you know, bound itself to be, uh, to be okay. controlled by that, by that court or by that. They, by that they have participated to some degree. Right. In the, uh, are any of, I think there are five other nuclear powers in the world other than England and uh, or great, uh, UK and France. Are yeah. any of those five in any of these conventions? That would be us, uh, yeah. China, Russia, Russia China. North Korea, and I believe Israel. Yeah, yeah. I, you're you're asking a question. I, I wish I could give you a better answer. I, I I just don't know exactly what the status is. You know, I mean, I would have to look at it, not only the treaty, and to see what they might have agreed to, but also the reservations. And I'm just not I'm not up to speed on that. I, I wish I was. I could satisfy your curiosity. That's the sort of thing you could probably look look in Google and satisfy your curiosity very very quickly. You know, I'm, I'm sure it's pretty easy easy to verify. Um, what about Cambodia? What was the result of that genocide? Yeah, that that's that is such a tumultuous story, right? Because there is a, they call it the extraordinary chambers for Cambodia. Uh, so there is a UN a UN court UN backed court. It is. It's a so-called hybrid court. So this is one that, that tries to blend um, Cambodian law and Com Cambodian legal personnel with international law. And um, it, it has, it's produced a very small handful of trials. Um, a fairly highly ranking person, uh, 
I don't know how to pronounce his name. It's D-U-C-H. Some people call him Duck. Other, calls it, other people call him Dooch. I'm not sure what the right pronunciation is. But he was a fairly high-ranking uh, member of the security service um, under the Khmer Rouge. Uh, I think he has since passed away, but he was convicted. And I think he was charged with, I know it was crimes against humanity. I do not, do not know if they charged him with genocide. I'm thinking maybe not. Maybe not genocide, but he was certainly convicted of, uh, of crimes against humanity. And I think he died in prison. So th those courts are still, are still going on. But of course, they were convened much, much later. They didn't really get underway, I think, until the 1990s, early 2000s. A very significant gap, right, between the, yeah. the events of the 1970s and the convening of these courts. In contrast with the Balkan Wars and with Rwanda, I mean, already in 1993, 94, you have judgments coming out of the ICTY pertaining to the Balkans Wars. And uh, for Cambodia, it took a while, but eventually they, they did form a tribunal. Yeah, I mean, they're the major, obviously the major genocides of our period. Was it a genocide? I mean, I guess it depends on how you define genocide, right? It was, some well, people call it an auto genocide because it was, who was being liquidated? They, 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 weren't, they were not religious groups. They weren't uh, ethnic groups. Although I guess the Chan was arguably an ethnic group. So you might've had a, a genocide within a larger crime against humanity. I mean, it's, it gets complicated when you start applying definitions, right? If you look at the UN Genocide Convention, its definition of genocide is, is fairly narrow. And I'm getting a lot of uh, attaboys in the, in the chat section. Thank you, but for those of you who had to leave or are leaving, thank you very much for attending. I greatly, greatly appreciate that. I appreciate you being on hand. Um, yeah. Uh, then, uh, tell me how to, uh, Francine, you have yeah, a question? Thank you. So I'm sorry that I came on a little bit late, but um, Dr. Bryan, I was just wondering, you know, this uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center has been instrumental in bringing so many war criminals um, to light. Um, do you know of any other groups that are doing this for some of the groups, other groups that you've mentioned, the Cambodia, the Rwanda, has that happened? Has yeah, happened? yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I, as you mentioned, uh, the Wiesenthal Center, I thought automatically of Fritz Bauer. Yeah. You know, who I'm sure you probably have heard of. Um, mm -hmm. the, it's, it's now believed that Bauer, who at the time was the, um, district attorney for Frankfurt, mm. um, was also a survivor, a Jewish survivor. Um, they, they believe that Bauer probably blew the, blew the whistle on Eichmann, mm -hmm. right? Um, so some, sometimes you have individuals. Uh, uh, I did research for my second book, I Witnessed a Genocide and ran into some, some of these individuals, uh, some of them in Israel, Mm. Some of them involved in law enforcement, both in Israel and in, and in Germany. Who, who, so there are good people, you know, throughout the world who, uh, who, who provided clues that, that led to the capture of some of these people. Um, so in terms of the Khmer Rouge and some of these other groups, mm. that's it's really beyond the limits of my, my knowledge right now. Yeah, I wish I could say. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. This was terrific. I, I hope it was helpful and I hope it was informative. That's, uh, that's the whole purpose, yeah. Um, I know we're just sort of getting to the end of, um, uh, I wonder if may just quickly, you could, could you mention genocide, the role that um, uh, Raphael Lemkin or even Hirsch played in, in uh, I know there's a whole book on them, uh, in uh, creating you know, the, uh, ge the term genocide and you know, uh, crimes against humanity. And both of them were legal scholars, but they also were activists in their own way, right? They were, yeah, especially Lemkin. Yeah, yeah. But Lemkin actually lobbied um, at London. He was in London when, when uh, the, the Americans, the French, the, and the, Br the British and the Soviets were working out the, what, would, what becomes the London Charter. This is the, the foundational document of the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. And it was issued in August of 1945. During that summer, Lemkin was there in London and he was, he was strongly lobbying the members of, of uh, the various delegations who were representing the big four. He was lobbying them to incorporate a genocide charge into the um, indictment of the, the Nazi war criminals. Of course, that wasn't done, but Robert Jackson, who was the head of the American team involved in um, setting up the court, of course, he was also, also had a hand in, uh, in writing the London Charter.
Jackson was quite desirous of incorporating something in the indictment that would talk about genocide. He actually thought that genocide was an important concept. He just didn't think there was enough, enough warrant in international criminal law and human rights discourse prior to 1945 to sustain the charge. I mean, you think of the, of our own constitution, there's a ban on ex post facto laws, right? Um, and there was a, a feeling that genocide might have been considered an ex post facto law and that German defense counsel might've been able to argue effectively with the judges to, to knock the charge out. And so instead what they did was, you know, they listed those different offenses that I mentioned, war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, conspiracy and, and membership in a criminal organization, those, those five charges. And then in the indictment, in the bill of particulars, they list uh, you know, genocidal acts which fall under crimes against humanity. Genocide is a crime against humanity and was referred to as such in, um, in the charter or in, in the indictment rather. But, but of course they didn't charge, specifically charge the Nazi defendants with, with genocide. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but could bo both of them, Hirsch and uh, mm -hmm. Raphael were both uh, sort of, I'm not survivors, but they had escaped uh, yeah. Yeah. Germany. Well, I mean, and both were po both were Polish, Polish, Polish both, I mean, yeah. And I don't know about Latterpacht, but um, almost almost all of Limpkin's family was murdered during the war. Right. Yeah. So, you know, he had a very. I mean, he was always involved in international um, human rights work, and uh, already in 1933 in Madrid, he outlined what would later become his uh, his idea of genocide. So already in 1933, the time that Hitler comes to power, Gen uh, Lemkin is already thinking along these lines, right? But certainly the events of the war really um, impelled him, you know, motivated him to elaborate on it even further and then publish it in 1944, and then to become an activist right thereafter. Yeah, he was a difficult character, I understand from the thing. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. People complained about him at Nuremberg, they complained about Lemkin, you know. They, <laughs> They, they, they thought he was a pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> he had a right to be, I think, but, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, some people, I guess, uh, you know, have, have a right to be pains in the neck. Uh, he would lean on people, you know, he would really try right. to, he would corral them and to kind of buttonhole them in the, in the hallway and try to drag them into a corner and harangue <laughs> them. And, yeah, but, but again, maybe this is how things get done. I don't know. But, well, eventually he succeeded, but it took a while, I guess. Yeah. Um, anyway, other questions? Um, Comments, yeah, I'd be happy comments, to entertain any them. Any comments? Yeah. Any, um, well, um, thank you so much for attending. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bryant, for, uh, for <laughs> obviously a very informative talk that uh, <clears throat> every time we, you know, we, we learn more and more. I mean, th these are major subjects, but it, it adds to our understanding of this whole question. Um, yeah, you know, the, the not only the Holocaust, but what, how it, you know, what, it, what its legacy may be. Yeah, Unfor unfortunately, these these issues are still very much with us. Uh, I, w I wish they weren't. I wish that uh, we could say they were permanently um, behind us, but that is not the case. So. No, we're sadly we're far from that. Sometimes we're we're regressing to a little bit, but uh, sometimes it seems that way, doesn't it? <laughs> but the idea, you know, the thing is there. Once they're established, at least they're out there and people can have something to bounce off against, even it's if it's- part, It's a part of people's horizons now. Right, and you made that point very clearly that before 45, that didn't exist, so yeah. very yeah. important. Not at all. But thank you for everybody for attending and I uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you again at some point in the future, maybe next year sometime. Yeah, for sure. We're gonna have you back as soon as your uh, book is out. Sounds great. Okay, take Thank care you. everybody. Thank you for attending and I hope uh, that our next pr program is on the 29th. Uh, we will be sending, if you haven't already gotten it, we'll send you a flyer on that. So we'll look forward to seeing you at that presentation. And thank and, you to everybody for your, for your kind uh, sidebar comments in the chat section. I, I, it's been a great pleasure to be with you today. All right, everybody have a good night. Bye-bye. People from all over, including um, Washington, D.C. Hey, how about that?